So, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Chris Keulmans. It's an honor to be back at the Astorka Theater and back at the Central European Forum. The place, according to my experience, where the best people are on stage, in the audience, tackling the most important questions of these times, including this year's edition, because it was an important question in 68 and it's an important question now. Let's demand the impossible. This is what we're going to try to do this afternoon. I cannot see you very well. Maybe we can have a bit more light on the audience, if that's possible. Exactly, that's what I wanted to ask you, but I can even not see the hands. <laughs> Who's been here yesterday and the day before? Fair number of people. It's been extraordinary. Last night, um, of course, and, and, and today again, I think we'll pick up, exactly, I think we'll pick up on some of the questions and issues that were raised uh, over the past few days. It's going to be an adventure this afternoon. I think this afternoon between now and around 8 o'clock is going to be like writing an essay together. Because we have a question. How to demand the impossible? Every essay starts with a question. But you don't know the answer yet. You don't know where you're going with the essay. What we do know is we are facing anti-democratic forces in our societies today, both in daily life, on the political level, on the media level, and online. Those forces seem so large that it's very, very difficult for us as simple, vulnerable individuals to stand up and resist. But this year, especially in this part of Europe, um, We've been energized by thousands and thousands of people on the streets protesting against corruption, claiming a decent society, claiming transparent politics, claiming reliable institutions. Thousands and thousands of people. Some of the organizers of those protests and marches will be here with us on stage this afternoon. And I keep thinking about last night, Svetlana Alexievich, such a, how do you say, m modest monument of a person. She said yesterday, um, the only thing that keeps her living and working in the face of all the horrors and tragedies is that she listens to people. The moments that she can listen to the voices and the stories of people that you otherwise do not see and hear. That is what keeps her going. After that, Ivan Kostev and Natalie Nugerede and Timothy Snyder went into a dazzling conversation on how, to, how we should attempt to create an idea for a collective future. Not just individual future, not just what is good for us, but what is good for the whole the whole of the community, the whole of the society. Today, in four different sessions between now and 8 o'clock, we'll have a number of fearless individuals who've been thinking and acting and writing um, to create a scenario where the whole world doesn't go in flames in the overheating world that we live in today. So. If you want to join us on this essay, where we're also curious for your questions and comments in the meantime, if you want to join us on this essay, let's start uh, here and now. And I want to introduce you to an uh, extraordinary young man from Norway. His name is Erik Kuschider. And here he is. There you go, Eric. Thank you very much. We, you've, you've been around for a few days. We'll get to that. But uh, to introduce Eric very shortly, um, 
student politically active uh, in the council of his town in Norway and in the region. But when he was 18 years old, in the summer of 2011, he was on that island, Utøya, that island where he and his fellow uh, participants in the meeting of, of the Workers' Youth League spent the annual summer camp. And on that day, on 22 July, Anders Breivik appeared on the island and started shooting indiscriminately, killing 69 young people. You remember that. Eric was there. And I'm so happy that you not just chose to join us here in Bratislava, but also that you took that experience and, and tried to overcome that by uh, keep working against violence, hatred, discrimination, mm. the, the, the big evil that many of us face. Now you, and that's why I ask you to, to be here first, um, we've been talking, we've been working, many of the people here, uh, in the face of evil, in the face of hatred, you literally stood eye to eye with evil in person, with Breivik. You survived. Many of your friends didn't. How did you pick yourself up after that experience and determined that you would try to prevent such things from happening again? Just hours after arriving at Sunval Hotel, after evacuating from the island, I was thinking of my friends and I was thinking how I should handle this, what am I going to do? And I realized that if, to, if it was me who would have lost my life, I would have wanted my friends to fight even harder for my, our, our ideals and our ideology. Even in those first hours, this is something you realized? Because I realized it was a political attack. Mm -hmm. that somebody attacked us for our beliefs, and that motivated me just to fight even harder. Yeah. You've, you've seen him there uh, on that day. You've also seen him in 2015 in court when he was at trial. Um, again, you observed him very closely. I'm somebody who cannot tolerate even looking in the face of somebody who thinks that I and all the values that I stand for should be exterminated. But you chose to look him in the eyes and to try to figure out what is going on there. You want to know how his mind works. How did you come to that decision? My goal was to understand what types of mechanism who, who gets a man with blue eyes and uh, blonde hair from the best part of Oslo to go out to an island and kill 69 people. And before that he killed eight people in the government quarters. And I wanted to understand what type of ideology, what type of meanings is it that makes it possible for a man to have such a distance, distance from other human beings and have such a distance that he doesn't regard us as human beings anymore. Because, and this is what you discovered, that he, in his own crazy, deranged way, he had created arguments for dehumanizing the other, in this case, you and what you stand for. Uh, how does that work? How does that dehumanizing work in the mind of a man like him? We are not human beings. We are just parasites who are destroying the society. And that distance, when you look at people, not as people anymore, that's how you can take a life, mm -hmm. because they are not worth anything. And uh, his way of coping with this was not to grieve after what happened, but he was very sad that he killed a mouse on his way on for, for his massacre on the island. And that was how he viewed us as human beings. And I remember attending the, the court hearings, and he realized that a lot of them who, was, who we had tried to kill were in the court with him, and he looked straight through us. 
Mm. We, we saw him in his eyes, but he looked straight through us. So we were not worth anything. Mm -hmm. And still, I have to think about what Timothy Snyder said last night. You were there too. He said, it's always better to understand what we fear than not to understand. In this case, of course, Breivik stands for something you fear. Uh, but you've gone into an investigation of how that kind of mind works. To be honest, I'm not most afraid of what he's saying and what he means. I'm most afraid of the indifference that mm -hmm. made this possible to happen. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is that a lot of people are seeing these types of opinions online. They're seeing that people are, are telling others that they should kill them, but they're not doing anything about it. And I believe that hate is not our, our, biggest, our biggest enemy, indifference is. Uh -huh. Indifference includes the idea that the people you don't like are not human beings. Yes. Yeah. And also that indifference, oh, it doesn't affect me personally, so it's not my problem. Yeah. He doesn't, your impression is he doesn't carry the burden of having committed a senseless massacre. That's true. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you yourself, you carry a burden. You carry the burden of anybody who survives. Because, of course, you think, I can imagine you think, why am I safe and are those others not? Mm. In your case, this is always an individual thing, of course, but in your case, you thought, OK, this gives me kind of responsibility. Can you talk about that? From the beginning, it was very important for me to remember my friends, remember my party colleagues and what they stood for. And the Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel, said, said that uh, to forget the dead would not only be offensive, uh, but it would, would, would be dangerous because it would be akin to killing them a second time. Mm -hmm. And for me, it has been very important to fight even harder for our ideals. Even though it's become much harder to participate in the political debate, I feel that that's the most important thing to do. And even in Norway, we are, we are not protected uh, by our social democracy. There is still a lot of, a lot of issues in, in regards to public speaking, in regards to participating in the debate. And I've experienced several times death threats and, and so on. But my, my way of handling this has always been confronting. Uh, I remember this one time, one of the mayor candidates for the far right party said that he should put a bullet in my head. And I met him on the street uh, and I said to him, well, I'm here now. What do you want to do with me? And he looked down, started mumbling, and he said he was sorry. Mm. And the problem is right here. He would probably not hurt anyone. But people who are reading his thoughts and his comments may be inspired. And that's what happened with, with Breivik. We, we, in Norway, we, we, have, we have a saying that they are sort of like, the, they don't fire the bullet, but they put it in the chamber. They put it in the chamber of the gun As in order for somebody else. Yeah. The whole experience, um, also led you to take responsibility as an active politician for the Social Democrat Party on municipal level, on regional level. Um, was your, how do you say, was your conviction to find your future in representative democratic politics not shaken by this outburst of violence against this kind of system? Actually, I think it got even stronger because by showing these atrocities and what happened in Norway and all over, over Europe, the developments made my belief in politics even stronger because it's now we need decent politicians and we need, uh, we need decent policy making. And that's why my belief is even stronger now, I guess. Okay. Many of us here believe that Norway is one of the handful of countries remaining in the world where um, Life is good, decent, civilized, including institutions, economy, and politics. Is it that fairy tale? Uh, well, we are also 
we are also affected by global trends in regards to criticizing of journalists, uh, politicians who are using populist attacks on on mainstream media and so on. So we are we are we are not protected uh, completely from mm -hmm. from, the, from our surroundings, and and of course we see a, a development where the debate is hardening, and we've had situations in Norway where, for example, our our justice minister needed to resign because she said that uh, on Facebook that the Labour Party was was more more um, more interested in protecting terrorists' rights than protecting the nation's security. Mm -hmm. It was in regards to uh, a case about uh, nationality and, and how we should handle taking away passports and so. So she she just attacked the Labour Party. So we see a lot of the same trends in Norway as we see in, in other Euro mm -hmm. European social democracies. You said before that um, one of the lessons you've tried to develop through this experience is that you see that many people in our societies can become estranged. They can become isolated, fortified in their own frustration about what's going on in the world. Uh, they feel powerless and this can lead people to radicalize. Uh, and you seem to be on a mission to, to prevent people from becoming estranged like that, to prevent people from radicalizing. How do you do that? Well, first we need to look at the mechanism, what makes people do things like that. And of course, there are different types of ideologies and different types of things that triggers this. But if you look at, look at the specific case in regards to Breivik, we see an entire life where he has fallen out of the system. Uh, where the childcare has not been good enough and the communication between the institutions are not good enough. So I think we have a lot to learn in regards to how we handle that. And because of this society, because we have an extreme increase in wealth and a lot of people are having it much better, it's even worse to be a loser now because mm -hmm. so many people have it so well. <clears throat> and one of the things that, that probably triggered him was that he thought he was a winner, but he was not. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to portray himself as the savior of Norway mm -hmm. uh, and in his own delusional mind. And he managed to do this also by engaging in a parallel society and removing himself from the society directly. Mm -hmm. And you see many, many other peoples who, in today's words, are the losers of our society. Um, they become more isolated, they, they, they fall through the, the, the web of the institutions that should take care of them. As a representative of the Social Democrats, can you, are you active in, in creating programs, um, funding initiatives, creating policy in order to keep people on board? I've been in uh, different types of committees for uh, the health directorate, uh, etc., where we have tried to de develop uh, functions which makes it easier for for people to get the help they need, lower the threshold of help, mm -hmm. and that has been also one of my important political priorities in, in Norway. But I see that we have a lot to learn from from each other. So I can't stand here today and say that my model is exactly the no. right one. But I believe that uh, cross-border cooperation in these matters will be really important in the future when we will see issues with people feeling overwhelmed by what's happening in regards to digitalization and, mm -hmm. and moving of jobs, etc. Yeah. Now, you're, you're very sharp on this cross-border cooperation, rightly so, I believe that too, mm, which also meant you were reading up on what's going on in Slovakia before you came here, this is your first visit. And just like me in Amsterdam, it's very difficult to get um, extensive, reliable news from what's going on here in Slovakia. Well, we're all part of Europe. Well, at least I've heard that social democrats here are not the same as in, in Norway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> because you arrived, you immediately dove into the heart of things. You were standing on the square on Friday night. How was that? It was an amazing experience, and I, uh, one of the one of the organizers translated a lot of the speeches here, and I see that we have a lot of the same values and ideals of what we want to develop our country into, and that's why I think cross-border cooperation is so important because a lot of the same mechanisms are happening here yeah. as in Norway. Of course, a very different story with the situa political situation here in here in Slovakia, uh, but still, I think there is a lot to learn. Yeah. Um, and returning to what you said earlier about Elie Wiesel, 
when you quoted him, you were also moved by the fact that um, this movement for a decent Slovakia was triggered to remember, commemorate, and, and, and carry on the work of Jan Kuczak, who was killed in February. Did you, did you feel that? Did you somehow link up to that, to that idea, we should not forget, we should carry on? You know, there is very few things that get me emotional. Even when people tell me they want me dead, I don't, I don't care so much about it. But when I see people get together, share a common, common goal, it moves me. And when I attended the protests and, I, and that I could hear this solidarity that we have not forgotten this journalist and that we will keep fighting for you on, it's, it's, it's marvelous. And, uh, and the way the organizers have been, have been working on the front row as well, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, I see that this is a trend in, in Europe in, in general that we are, we are moving apart from the party, party, party politics and we're moving into movements mm -hmm. instead. And that's what happening. That, that's what's happening happening here as well. Yeah. I myself am more of a collectivist. So I still believe in the in, in the party party politics, uh, and that was also, as you mentioned in the beginning, why I chose to engage more after what's happened, because I believe that the biggest, uh, the best solutions we can find together. I guess. So did you? Okay. We'll have one of the organizers of uh, For Decent Slovakia, Tanja Sledakova, here on stage in a minute. But um, have you entered meeting the people who are, who are, you know, on the streets here? Have you entered into a discussion about if it makes sense to go into party politics? Because here the trust in participation in party politics is lower than in Norway, I'm sure. Have you entered into that discussion? Yes, I met with several uh, people, um, for example, representatives from Progressive Slovakia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see that there is a movement here rising now, also a political party. I will not indulge myself too much in, uh, in Slovakian uh, politics, but I think it's good that we see now a central-left party in this country who can manage to do a lot of good in, in regards to political priorities. But I see that the trust is very low in regards mm. to established parties, as we've also seen in, in, in Europe. And um, yeah. You also told me that um, whenever you go to a city you haven't been before, you like to go to the oldest, most traditional pubs late at night in order to meet the real people. Is that also a thing about trying to understand people who might not think and behave like you? Yes, because when you attend a political conference or you meet party colleagues from other countries, it's very hard to get a direct, direct opinion what is happening mm. in that country. But when you meet people on a, on a brown pub and you tell them that you're interested in politics, it may go very well. But it also may, may end very bad if they get very, very angry. But it's still a, a great way of speaking directly to the people and learn about their challenges in their daily life. So what were you talking about last night at 2 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> I'm not sure if I can say that publicly. <laughs> but, uh, talking about how we can make Slovakia more equal, how we can make the regions more equal, and how we can make the school system better for Slovakia. That was the discussion. Mm -hmm. See, that is what you talk about late at night in the bars of Bratislava. But I'm, I'm maybe not a more normal pub talker, though. Mm, I'm sure you're not. Mm. But um, you, you, you're continuing, I mean, you're continuing the conversation uh, as we speak here. How, how can you, how do you say, consolidate the, the, the first alliances that you've created here now? Well, uh, I think that I will keep in contact with a lot of the people from this conference because we obviously had a, have a lot to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think I had like 15 friend requests uh, after attending this conference. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I think I think that uh, I think that grassroots level uh, activism, as this pro protest also uh, demonstration also has been, mm -hmm. is one of the best ways of developing policy. And if you have the trust of the people, and if it comes as a grassroots initiative, you will manage to hit a nerve and a pulse. Mm -hmm. And that is maybe what Slovakia has been lacking. And I think that in the future, Slovakia uh, will have great possibilities in, in, in regards to activism. Mm -hmm. So I'm crossing my fingers for you guys. Mm -hmm. And you'll be back, of course. Of course, I love Slovakia and I mm. love Bratislava. Oh my God, he's become a patriot already after three days. Who in the audience would like to ask or comment on Eric's experience and observations? Not immediately. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Are we gonna? Rada by som vedela, aký je názor norskej spoločnosti. Excuse me. Um, I would like to... I can sure, that. sure, but we don't have the headphones yet. Um, can I ask you, what is the Norway public's opinion to the sentence which Breivik got, which is 22 years, and yours may be two, okay? It's a very interesting and very, very, very uh, debated question in Norway as well. Especially, can you, can you explain the question a bit for me? Oh, okay. Uh, she, she asked in, in regards to the penalty Bre Breivik got, and uh, that he was sentenced to 21 years, and uh, what do I and the Norwegian public think about it? Uh, and the answer is, it's, uh, it's been a debate, especially about, uh, among youths, in, in regards to death penalty and, and so on. Uh, the public opinion is that the the, uh, the the penalty he got was was correct, because it's our justice system uh, who, who sentenced him to 20, 21 years, but he will not get out after 21 years. We have 30 to 40 prisoners in Norway uh, who are still a threat to the society and will still be, be kept in in prison. If that was an answer to mm -hmm. your to to your question, mm -hmm. I I didn't <clears throat> I didn't think of this penalty, but I saw twenty two years was really short. Mm. Yes, the Americans are very shocked. So every time I get <laughs> a message he from was, Americans, he was that young, you know, when mm. when he. Uh, You're talking about life sentence. Yes, yes, mm. yes. Because I I find him dangerous any any time of his life. That's great. <clears throat> Others. Not immediately. Um, I want to. I don't want to. I don't expect you to be an expert in Slovak politics after such a short time. But when we um, met each other earlier today, you said your your impression after having some political talks here uh, these days. Thank you for the headphones. One of your first impressions about the political situation today in Slovakia is that you think there seems to be a vacuum in the center-left of the system. Could you talk a little bit about that? It seems, as, as we talked about, uh, the trust to the established parties are, are, uh, are very low. And uh, uh, I see that there has been a lacking in, in, in the, in the centre-left, especially in regards to, to liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, from what I've heard, there is no Slovakian member of the ALDE party group in the European Parliament mm -hmm. uh, until now, until the progressive uh, Slovakia. And there is a lot of young people who believe in progressive policies and obviously haven't found a party they can trust to, uh, to, ha to handle their, mm -hmm. uh, their trust. So. Like briefly, that that is actually that is that is my that is my impre impression. First impression. First impression. Yeah, because this is the the domain within the political field that you, with your party in Norway, are trying to to refresh and develop. Yeah, the Labour Party in Norway mm -hmm. is the central left uh, yeah. left party. Yeah. Okay. Don't be shy. Thomas Boutoura up here, and the microphone is coming to you, sir. You asked about the parties on the left, and 
In the last time, in the last weeks and months, several essays and studies were published in articles which are analyzing and describing rather different phenomenon, and it is that, uh, and I simplify a bit, that in a civil society in general, and it is from Latin America to Europe to Asia, to Asia that it's the opposite trend is uh, possible to notice, and it is the increase of, uh, I would say, conservative elements and conservative grassroots groups, conservative uh, movements. So uh, do you see something similar uh, also in Scandinavia and in Norway? We saw some results of some elections, or do you perceive it as just a cycle? It's, it's, it's rather now a conservative tone, it, it will pass, and again, another I will line will be, will be supported. <clears throat> if there are any conservative grassroots movements growing in, in, in Scandinavia? Yeah, it's a worldwide phenomenon, as you say, so yeah. you see that probably in Scandinavian countries as well. Do you think that is going to expand, or is it a phase we're going through? Well, there is, there is, there is a trend in, 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 all, in all countries, as, as you mentioned. Uh, because the problem has been that the people have not felt that the politicians are talking directly to them and are answering their questions and, and their problems and, their, uh, and their, their cases they're wondering about. So, of course, there has been a development in Norway as well, especially in regards to, to populism, as I mentioned earlier with our justice minister who, who had to resign because of her uh, awful message on, on, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So we see the same trends in, in Norway's mail as well. Maybe not as, as strong, but, but they're still there. Yes. Cool. Eric, thank you so much. We're going to move on, and I hope you can stay. We're going to move on to talk about the, the demonstrations on the streets in this country and others in the region. So for now, I just want to ask you for very clear, very powerful a very, how do you say, uh, um, encouraging stance that you took from one of the tragedies of this century. Thank you so much, Eric Schutte.